Let us begin this session with a simple definition of biodiversity. As suggested by the name, bio means living and diversity means variety. Thus, the variety of living organism present at a place is known as biodiversity. Different plants, animals, marine life, microorganisms, insects, habitats, ecosystem, etc. that makes our planet so unique and so fascinating this term is popularized by the german sociologist edward wilson to describe combined diversity at all levels of biological organization the most important of them are genetic diversity a single species that shows high diversity at the genetic level over its distributional range For example, India has more than fifty thousand genetically different strain of rice and one thousand varieties of mangoes. Species diversity, that is the diversity at species level. For example, Western Ghats have a greater amphibian species than Eastern Ghats. The next is ecological diversity, the diversity at the ecosystem level. India has a variety of ecosystem with its deserts, rainforest, mangroves, wetlands, estuaries, coral reefs and alpine meadows. Diversity of life is not evenly distributed. Tropical region supports more life than polar region. That's why India has greater ecosystem diversity than other Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland. these countries are located near to polar region india has taken million of years of evolution to accumulate this rich diversity in nature but we could lose all that wealth in less than 2 centuries if the present rates of species loss continues you know how many species are there on earth and how many in india it is not easy to answer the question of how many species there are on earth According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources (IUCN), in 2004, the total number of plant and animal species described so far is slightly more than 1.5 million. But we have no clear idea of how many species are yet to be discovered and described. More than 70% of all the species recorded are animals, while plants, including algae, fungi, bryophytes gymnosperms and angiosperms comprise no more than 22% of the total among animals insects are the most species rich taxonomic group making more than 70% of the total that means out of every 10 animals on this planet 7 are insects again how do we explain this enormous diversification of insects The number of fungi species in the world is more than the combined total of the species of fishes, amphibians, reptiles and mammals. India has only 2.4% of the land area of the world, but its share of the global species diversity is an impressive 8.1%. That is what makes our country one of the 12 mega diversity countries of the world. Nearly 45,000 species of plants and twice as many of animals have been recorded from India. Did you know how many living species are actually there waiting to be discovered and named? If we accept May's global estimates, only 22% of the total species have been recorded so far. Probably more than 1 lakh plant species and more than 3 lakh animal species are yet to be discovered and described. Now let us discuss the next important concept that is patterns of biodiversity. Diversity of plants and animals is not uniform throughout the world. Some of the patterns of biodiversity are latitudinal gradient. In this pattern species diversity decreased from equator towards poles. There are greater number of species in tropics as compared to temperate and polar region. For example, Colombia which is located near to the equator has nearly 1400 species of birds while new york at 41 degree north 
has 105 species and Greenland which is further located at 71 degree north has only 56 species. So we can conclude that as we go away from the equator number of species decreases. This is because tropical latitudes have remained relatively undisturbed for millions of years thus had a long evolutionary time for species diversification. Tropical environments are less seasonal, relatively more constant and predictable. Such constant environments promote niche specialization and lead to a greater species diversity. There is more solar energy available in the tropics. Because of this, there is more species diversity near the equator. Species Area Relationships the great German naturalist and geographer Alexander von Humboldt observed that within a region, species richness increased with increasing explored area, but only up to a limit. Now let us discuss what is the importance of species diversity to the ecosystem. Does the number of species in a community really matter to the functioning of the ecosystem? This is a question for which ecologists have been able to give a definitive answer. For many decades, ecologists believed that communities with more species generally tend to be more stable than those with less species. A stable community should not show too much variation in productivity from year to year. It must be either resistant or resilient to occasional disturbances. These disturbances can be both natural or man-made. It must also be resistant to invasions by alien species. We don't know how these attributes are linked to species richness in a community, but a David Tillman's long-term ecosystem experiments using outdoor plots provide some tentative answers. Tillman found that plots with more species showed less year-to-year -year variation in total biomass. He also showed that in his experiments, increased diversity contributed to higher productivity. Hence, we realize that rich biodiversity is not only essential for ecosystem health as well as for the survival of the human race on this planet. And now, loss of biodiversity. The biological wealth of our planet has been declining rapidly and the accusing finger is clearly pointing to human activities. The last 20 years alone have witnessed the disappearance of 27 species. Now this data is as per NCRT which was written in 2007. Loss of biodiversity in a region may lead to decline in plant production. Second, lowered resistance to environmental perturbations such as drought. And finally, increased variability in certain ecosystem processes such as plant productivity, water use and pest and disease cycles. Did you know the causes of biodiversity losses? The first one is habitat loss and fragmentation. Habitat loss occurs when natural habitats are converted to human uses such as crop plant, urban areas and infrastructure development. For example, once tropical rainforest covered 14% of the earth's land, but now only 6% of it is tropical rainforest and rest is used by humans. Second is overexploitation of natural resources by humans resulting in degradation and extinction of the resources. For example, stellar sea cow, passenger pigeon and many marine fishes have extincted in the last 500 years because of overexploitation of natural resources by humans. The third is alien species invasion. When alien species are introduced unintentionally, it may become invasive and cause decline to the indigenous native species. For example, when Nile perch was introduced into Lake Victoria in East Africa, it led to extinction of cichlid fish in the lake. Now the next cause of decline of biodiversity is co-extinction. When a species become extinct, the plant and animal species associated with it in an obligatory way also become extinct. For example, when a fish is extinct, the parasite associated in an obligatory manner on that fish also become extinct. Now while hearing all this, the question that pops in our mind is why should we conserve biodiversity? Conservation of biodiversity is considered under three categories narrowly utilitarian, broadly utilitarian and ethical. 
The broadly utilitarian argument says to conserve biodiversity because of the morals and the responsibility that humans have towards nature and as biodiversity plays a major role in many ecosystem services, we should conserve biodiversity. On the other hand, the narrow utilitarian criteria of biology conservation of diversity are the one where the humans conserve biodiversity because of needs. But we need to realize that every species has an intrinsic value. Even if it may not be of current or any economic value to us, we have the power and with power comes the great responsibility. So it is our moral duty to care for their well-being and pass on our biological legacy in good order to our future generations. Now how do we conserve biodiversity? There are two basic approaches to conserve biodiversity, in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. In situ conservation is also known as on-site conservation. Conservation and protection of species in their natural habitat, that is on-site conservation. Now, biodiversity hotspot are type of in situ conservation. Regions with very high levels of species richness and high degree of endemism that are identified for maximum protection. Here, endemism means species confined to a region and not found elsewhere. There are 36 biodiversity hotspots in the world, out of which 4 are in India, the Himalayas, the Western Ghats, the Indo-Burma region and the Sunda land that includes Nicobar group of islands. Now in NCRT, this data is different. It has written that there are 34 hotspots in the world, out of which 3 are in India. These are Western Ghats and Sri Lanka, Indo-Burma and Himalaya. In India, ecologically unique and biodiversity rich regions are legally protected as biosphere reserves, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Now what are sacred grooves? Tracts of forest where all the trees and wildlife within are worshipped and given total protection. Hunting and logging are usually strictly prohibited within these patches. For example, Khasi and Jaintia hills in Meghalaya. Example 2 is Western Ghats of Karnataka and Maharashtra and 3 Sarguja, Chanda and Bastar areas of Madhya Pradesh where you can find such sacred grooves. Now this is an example of in situ conservation. Now what is ex situ conservation? It is also known as off site conservation. Here conservation of threatened species in special setting where they are protected and given special care that is off site conservation. It has been protected by following method. First zoological park. Many animals that have become extinct in the wild but continued to be maintained in zoological parks. Also there are botanical gardens. Also wildlife safari is an example of ex situ because wildlife is brought from their natural habitat and placed in special setting. Cryo preservation techniques are also the example of ex situ conservation. Using this technique, the gametes of threatened species can be preserved in viable and fertile condition for long periods. Then the eggs can be fertilized using in vitro techniques. Seed bank is also an example of ex situ conservation. Using this method, seeds of different genetic strains of commercially important plants can be kept for a long periods. Now biodiversity conservation measures at a global level. Biodiversity knows no political boundaries and its conservation is therefore a collective responsibility of all nations. Now here we will take a look at two important summits or organization, the Earth Summit. It was a meeting of several nations at Rio de Janeiro in 1992 to discuss appropriate measures for conservation of biodiversity. We are looking into this because this is mentioned in NCRT. Also, the World Summit on Sustainable Development 2002. It was meeting of several nations in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2002 to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. Basically, it was awareness campaign, which included tens of thousands of participants, including head of state and government, national delegates and leaders from non-governmental organizations. 
The aim of this meeting was to divert the focus of world and providing direct action towards meeting difficult challenges including improving people's lives and conserving our natural resources in a world that is growing in population with ever increasing demands for food water shelter sanitation energy health services and economic security so this is why it is important for us to conserve the biodiversity i hope you like this session and if you have any doubts please comment below in the comment section